Right, let's start. So today we will learn about the former string vulnerability. And basically what we will learn is like we can fool the printf by playing with the first argument of the printf, which is the so-called format string. That is with a lot of percent %p, percent %d, something like that. And then I'm sure that the, you have seen that in ASRL2 and ASRL5. And then you might don't know what that means, but the, it thankfully leaks some of the address for us. So for those challenges, I use that to give a hint that the printf can turn into malicious primitives. Yeah. And then like the, in this lecture, you will learn about how to play with that. Yeah. And then basically the method would be, uh, we will basically turn the printf into either arbitrary write or arbitrary read primitives. So we just seen that like the, in ASRL two and five, it just leak it sequentially. But today you will learn about the, how to turn that into arbitrary read and write. And then you will be surprised that the printf has a write capability because printf is just a printing function. So it will just read the memory, but it has a writable fun functionality. Yeah. So we let's do a little recap about the arbitrary read and write. So we run about arbitrary or sequential read. So to break the ESRL, we need to leak some of the addresses to learn about the address space layout. And without doing that, we have practiced that the brute force attack could be possible, but in 32 bit that works. But the last night on the 1 a.m. or something, like one of the students asked me that, like the he wants to use a stack address. And then I just a uh, captured like the, the slide about the odd that he could have is one over half a million. Yeah, please don't do that. And then like the library space is quite neat. Some of the students got it like the nine trials, but the, some other 100, 200 or something. But the, that kind of trials is a manageable and feasible one. But that only works for the 32-bit machines. If it gets to the 64-bit machine, you'd better purchase a Powerball. Yeah. Right. So, so the implication is that the ASRL is actually a very effective defense. So its overhead is just one to three percent, and sixty-four bit the performance overhead is just one percent. So it's something like a why not use that? So those kind of technology can easily be adopted to the uh, real systems because it does not harm the performance much. It does not harm the multi-core or scalability. Yeah. So. Those differences are great, but on the flip side, we can easily avoid evade those differences uh, with another attack. So the arbitrary or sequential read has a, that kind of implication. So it's, if I use a little bit of analogy, it's something similar to like the, before having a battle, you need to do a recon. And then arbitrary read is about like doing recon about uh, what kind of things are there and then finding attack targets. Yeah, those things are done by arbitrary read. And uh, pairwise, we do have arbitrary write capability. And then this is the actually launching the attack. So arbitrary write means that like the, the capability of the attacker that the, the attacker can target an address. It could be sequential, but it could be arbitrary memory address. But to do that, you need to learn the address layout first. So that's why most of the arbitrary read write challenges, it asks you to launch arbitrary read first to break ASRL and then launch arbitrary write to perform the actual attack. And previously up to week five, we learned about the all the attacks are overriding the return address or some other control data, but uh, it does not have to be with a more powerful primitive arbitrary write, uh, we can overwrite, directly overwrite the return address without uh, uh, smashing the stack cookie. So if you have a arbitrary write capability, stack cookie is no longer uh, effective defense at all. If you have a arbitrary read, ASRL is no longer arbitrary, uh, the, the effective defense at all. And then with the power of the ROP, DEP is no longer effective defense against our, our, the attack. So by learning all these techniques in combination of the arbitrary read and write, uh, I believe that you can avoid almost all of the defenses. 
So if you search about the CVE, the CVE is like the numbering of the known vulnerabilities as it stands for common vulnerability exposure. So the reason for like having that kind of thing is like the uh, warning the uh, programmers and then system designers that the, this application, this version has a vulnerability, so don't use that. And then if you search about like the CVE Nginx, CVE or like a, uh, some of the iPhone or something, then you will see a lot of word that the out of bound write, out of bound read. These are actually buffer overflow, out of bound, right? And then you will also see that the arbitrary write, arbitrary read. Yeah, these are corresponding to the uh, the techniques that we learned in this week. And then, if you thoroughly search about that, so some of the description will say. One vulnerability allows arbitrary read. Another vulnerability allows arbitrary write. Ultimately, it would allow attackers to achieve arbitrary code execution, ACE. Yeah. That's the most dangerous attack in modern era. And then arbitrary code execution, what that means is like you can run get a shelf yeah. or like any kind of code. And then you can launch Rob or something uh, to run whatever you want. Any questions about the arbitrary read, write, and then general description about like the, so I just wanted to emphasize that the importance of learning arbitrary read, write as an abstract concept is because like most of the modern attacks on the memory corruption, yeah, they are fall into those two classes for like the attacking method. No question? Am I the best teacher ever? <laughs> right, next move on to the next. So <clears throat> the reason why we learned about the arbitrary read write first is that, so I want to teach format string vulnerability. And then basically we will turn this printf and then take a look at this printf. Printf and its first argument must be something like this kind of the string that contains percent d x s p to print out like the following arguments but that there are some cases that this kind of the format string can be generated programmatically and then we can use some of the writable variable as a first argument of the printf so it will definitely generate warning because the type of the first argument of the printf is const character pointer. That means it must be marked as a string literal const character pointer that we cannot change. Yeah. So like the, if you run like this kind of thing, then it will generate the uh, compilation warning. But uh, common practices are, they if they have to use that, they suppress that warning. And then in like the, when I introduce a little bit of defense about like ASRL, DEP, and those kind of thing, uh, I emphasize that like the we must not ignore compilation warning. But uh, what we have practiced in like I also did that uh, in like the uh, doing some of the homework uh, for a college. Yeah, we always ignore compilation warning, and then if it generates a binary, yes, submit it. Yeah, that's the practice, and then almost all of the students are trained like that. So I believe that's why it's happening in the reality too. Yeah. So we should stop that. Yeah. So after learning about this class, yeah, please enable dash w error. It will regard all the warning as an error. So compiler will never generate binary program for you. So it will make you, it will bug you a lot. Yeah. But uh, what as a result you will get the secure program after following all the practices uh, worn by the compiler that's a side story but the important thing is so if we can alter the first argument of the printf then we can do many things like this and then now you have a you have a conceptual idea and also some of the students have already started week six challenges then like the, you practice it about like the, how the arbitrary read and arbitrary write could be dangerous to the program. 
So let's learn about how we can play with the printf function. So for my string, how it works is like that we can uh, write about like the preferable format to print out some of the, uh, the strings into the console, or it could be used for generating another string. So printf is one of the printf family function. So likewise, we have like the exec B, E, exec B, exec L, exec LP, or those kind of functionality. So all those functions uh, will get into like a print, uh, the exec B, but the, for the printf, so there's a VS printf, and then that's the original printf, and then all the other functions named with the something printf or a null printf, yeah, these are internally using the VS printf, yeah. And then that's for like handling the variable arguments. So the, one of the interesting characteristic about the printf is like the, it only defines the type for the first argument as a constructor character pointer. And then they don't care about like whatever arguments comes after. They don't care about the type because type will be defined by the format string itself. And also they don't care about the, how many arguments we push on it. And then What's happening in reality in the disassembly is that they don't check how the arguments were pushed to the printf. CPUs are dumb, code are dumb, they don't know. Humans are smart, so we can put weird format string to make them believe that the, we pushed the 100 arguments or something. So the vulnerability is that, so to print out the buffer data to the console, Oh, so another thing to notice like the printf is just printing the data string to the console. But if you use s printf, it will generate another string. And then first argument is the target string writable one. And then second argument will be the format string. And then there's a more secure version of the s printf because s printf does not check the size. So if we put a long size, we can incur the, the buffer overflow vulnerability. So same thing about the string copy. String copy do not check the size. So we must use a, a, a strn CPY to specify the length. Uh, printf function also has the sn printf output as a string and as a length and then form a string kind of thing. Yeah. So this kind of the form a string vulnerability affects to the all the printf related functions. Yeah. And then the vulnerability is that, that to print out the buffer data like this, this one. Yeah. So the correct way of doing that is like, a, you know the type, then like printf, percent s and buff. Then there's no problem at all. It will read the buffer data and then print out beautifully on the console, that's it. But another way to print that out is like using printf buff. If you try it, it will work. Uh, it will generate the compiler warning, but it will work. Then what if, if we put the buffer data as a percent P percent P percent P percent P percent like that. So this is totally valid because printf. And then there's a format string as a constructor character pointer. And then in C, there's a no method that we can check argument number of the printf. We don't know. Yeah, they allow it. So modern compiler, whenever we use printf, they check the function name and then try to take a look at the const literals and then uh, count the number of the uh, format uh, directives and then try to match the argument number. So it may generate a warning but up to GCC four or five, they don't have any kind of warning. Yeah. So what it does is actually, so printf don't know how many arguments were pushed. So suppose we have a stack, it only pushes one argument, the format string itself. And then if we do percent P, percent P, percent P, then it go up the stack and then print out the stack values. And then we use that 
in the ASRL2. So if you check the ASRL2 challenge source code, then you will see that I put the 15% P's and then it prints out something. And then you can find the sum of the stack address in there. The reason is it will print out some of the garbage data on the stack because we didn't push anything. Yeah. So that's why you can watch some of the stack data spill from the console and then you can break the ASRL. So the easy way, easiest way to turn the format string vulnerability into the sequential read vulnerability is put a lot of percent P, then it will beautifully print out all the stack values as a hexadecimal integer. Yeah. Thank you to print out. And then we will learn about some of the basics of the printf. So format string will have a typed format. And then if we have a string, we must use percent %s. If we want to print out an integer value as a decimal number, then we need to use percent %d or percent %u for the unsigned integer decimal number. And percent %x is for hexadecimal number but the, it does not match the uh, length. But if you use percent %p in 32-bit, it will always attach 0x and then zeros if the value is small. So it will always print 0x and an eight-digit hexadecimal number in 32-bit. And in 64-bit, it will be 0x, some 16-digit something. Oh. But the nowadays, like that, they just put the 0x0, 0x1, those kind of values. But the, if you want to get the more beautiful output, I would recommend the 0x percent 016x. Yeah. Uh, you will realize that later. Yeah. And then if you use that, then, then you will always have the fixed length hexadecimal string. And then there are values that the floating point and double numbers and then character numbers, and then there are the directives for that. And then many functions in libc, printf, sprintf, uh, I missed after here, vs printf, sm printf, uh, there are a lot of printf functions. And there are also f printf that uses file descriptors as in uh, uh, directing output. All those things are uh, susceptible to this kind of vulnerability. And the type of the printf is like the specified as a format string must be const character pointer. So we must use this kind of a string literal to not have any kind of compilation warning. But the interesting part is that the argument number is specified as a dot, dot, dot. Yeah. And then one interesting story about this is like the, uh, I'm the, in the, like the uh, older end of the millennial. And then most of the millennial or X generation or an older, if they see dot, 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 they feel like, oh, there are something many, but the, they don't talk anything, uh, omit it. But uh, what I heard from internet in recent days, like the Gen Z, uh, if I use dot, dot, dot in message or something, uh, and then like the, why this guy don't say anything? Yeah, so that's what I heard. Is that real? Yeah. <laughs> right. So that 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 here is like the oh there could be too many arguments so we omit. <laughs> that's the meaning. And then the C language is like the built by the boomers, so <laughs> that's why. <laughs> <laughs> and then I also don't like C language. We must use a Rust or other languages that is memory safe. And then there is another version of the language called Carbon. Yeah. Yeah, that will be much better alternative. So important thing is like we can put any number of arguments to printf, but we will not. Then we will not put any kind of the additional arguments, but just play with the format string. And let's take a look how it works. So if we just put the percent %d and then argument is one and call printf, then this is the stack of the internal of the printf function. So you can think it as push one, push percent %d, and call printf. Then the CPU will automatically store the return address. And then at the function prolog of the printf, it will have a push ebp and then 
uh, move EBP, ESP, sub ESP, those kind of things. So it will create a new stack frame. And then the diagram on the left, uh, left side, uh, right side, uh, depicts that. And then if we call percent app, print app, this kind of the format string and then three arguments, it will be format string, eh, eh, eh. excuse me. Then what happens if we call these kind of functions with the, this argument? So we didn't push any kind of thing to the arguments. And then printf will believe that there are that many of the arguments and then it will keep moving up and up and up and spilling the stack data. And that's what is happening when you invoke the check function in the SRL2. So I intentionally put this and then most of you don't know about like what that, what that does, but the interesting thing is like, I didn't push any kind of additional arguments. Yeah. So how this work is that I just put percent P, percent P, percent P in the example. This is the internal stack of the printf. And then it will get X, 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 X as a first argument for the format string. Y, 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 Y as a second argument. Z, 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 Z as a third argument. So it will work as a sequential read primitive. So if you write the, this kind of code, I believe like if this is the one of the, the challenge uh, program, a simplified one. So the program will get your input to the buffer and then directly supply that to the printf function. And then if you put percent %p a lot, then it will print out all these values like that. And then, do you see anything interesting output from here? This is space percent P, space percent P, space percent P. Do you know why that's happening? So in the stack, we have a buffer and then we push the argument of the format string and then call printf percent P, percent P, percent P, and then it will eventually hit the buffer and then it will print out buffer content. So buffer content that we supply was like a percent P space, percent P space. So you are seeing those kind of results here. So you can see that the printf actually work as a sequential read primitives to print out some values there. So if the argument is this one, if we use percent D, we will get the decimal integer, but you can get that output to the pawn tools and then translate to the integer. Percent X is the hexadecimal, percent P is a pretty version of the hexadecimal number. And then percent S is, so percent S is interesting. So percent D X P, they regard the argument as a value. But for percent %s, it will regard the argument as a pointer, and then it will dereference the pointer and then read the content. So this is different. So if we use percent %p for some of the pointer, it will print out pointer address value. But if we use percent %s on this address, then it will print out the content stored in the memory. Yeah, that's the interesting part. Any questions up to this point? So it's just the usage of the printf. Yeah, maybe you got confused at the why I keep talking about like the usage of the printf. And then I have to talk about the usage of the printf again because there is a weird usage. So printf can be, so if you, if you put a lot of percent P, then that could be just a sequential read but it can be turned into arbitrary read because we can specify the argument position to the directives. So the example is percent $1 something D directives. 
So I colored all each of the numbers and then the directives to match with the uh, this description. So if we write the directive like this, percent one dollar D, or for example, percent three dollar D, three means that they take the third argument to the printf and then use that and print as a decimal number. Percent thirteen dollar thirty S. What this means is that get the third 18th argument and then regard that as a pointer and then read the string out of it and then match the length as a 30. Yeah. So percent one dollar zero eight D is argument position is one. So get the first additional argument of the printf and then length is eight. And then if the length is not matched with eight, fill with zero, and then regard that as a integer. Yeah. So let's go for some of the examples. So what this will print. Take the second argument, first and second, 13, and then regard that as a decimal number, eight length, fill with zero, this one. Eight lengths, and then 13 as a decimal number. And then second argument, zero X, percent zero X is just a printing zero X, percent three, zero X, eight X. So the third argument is 14. So that's a hexadecimal number D fill with zero and then match with the, align with the length eight. So it's something like this. And then percent three, 20 S. What this will be result in? No. It, it will difference which number? 14, then what will happen? Yes, <laughs> you have seen this a lot, segmentation fault, <laughs> because 13 is not a valid address. Yeah, so this is this results in the segmentation fault. Then percent four dollar 20 S. So the fourth argument is this one, right? So it will print out something like this. So any questions about this method? And then I just uh, give the one, two, three, four as an example, but you can actually put one billion, one million, any kind of number, and then it just adds the number to the stack in 32 bit. If I place N, N multiplied by four will be added to this stack. ESP, EBP to choose the argument. And then in 64 bit, n multiplied by eight will be added to the ESP plus C and the EBP plus C, and then read about the step. So using this method, we can actually point arbitrary address if you know that the, where your RBP or EBP is at. That's how we can turn in this into arbitrary rate. So let's get into some of the examples for the challenges. So the format string read. So my challenges are very explicit. Yeah, you can focus on the like the that part to solve that. Format string use the read functionality of that, and then level one is easy, and then has a thirty-two bit and sixty-four bit. And uh, what challenge asks you is like the it will set a random value. And then read random function reads the random value from dev u random is not as random at all. So you cannot use a as rent trick. Yeah. So it's difficult, but it will get your name. And then you don't know, you don't want to use your real name, but uh, you want to use present something name here. And then that will be supplied to the printf. So there's a format string variability. And then it asks, can you guess the random number? 
then if that number is matched, then it will give you the shell. So what you can do is, so you can think of how the stack works. Also, you can take a look at the disassembly and uh, you can calculate the distance from the first argument, the format string to the random number as the relative offset to e or EBP. Yeah. Then if you supply that number of a percent something, yeah, percent X or something, percent P, then you can leak the random number. So how you can solve this is, suppose you put like the uh, nine percent P's, yeah. So if you type random guess as this one, then it will kindly let you know about the, what was the random number, but what you typed. But can you see that number is printed at here? Yeah. So with this challenge, you can practice looking the stack values, local variables or control data, yeah, using percent P as an exploit vector. And the important thing is that the, how you can calculate the distance between the percent P, so percent one, two, three, four, five, six. So if we use percent six dollar P, then it will print out the random value immediately. And how you can calculate that is, so if you check the disassembly, so it will do read random, and then the return value will be stored into the EAX, and that will be stored into EBP minus ZRX50. Yeah. So random value is at EBP minus ZRX50. Yeah, we have had a hard week one uh, to identify this very quickly. So you will have something like this, and then from the return address, uh, so, so random is at the EVP minus zero x fifty, and then if you check that there is a, like the uh, sub ESP and push, so it will consume. 16 bytes, yeah. So if you check the full disassembly, because like the ESP was self-tracked as a 0x54, that's why it has a 54 as a distance, but the we the code puts a random value at the EVP minus 0x50. And then sub ESP minus C is three blocks, uh, it's quite slow. And then push the format string, the buffer address here. Yeah. And then print out. So first argument, second argument, and then we can calculate that, that that's the sixth argument. Yeah. So code is fixed and code will never lie, never tell a lie. And then that code, I do not mean the source code. This assembly code, it will tell everything to you. So you can regard the disassembly as a blueprint to the building. Yeah. And then if you have that, then you can calculate the exact distance from the printf arguments to the random variable. So the one method, easy one, is like you can put a lot of percent p. But uh, another method is that uh, you can correctly identify where it is and then print that. So the first challenge is easy. You can put a lot of print out a percent P then then you will see that value from here. But uh, I'm a gamer. So I created a second challenge as the, it has a long distance from the, your stack and buffer and then your random variable is somewhere there, but the location is not randomized. So please take a look at the disassembly and then calculate the exact distance. And then I also limited 
the number of the size of the buffer to very small, you must use dollar directive. Yeah. So you cannot put like 100% P. No, the buffer size is quite small. Yeah. So what you need to do is you need to practice this kind of the selecting argument option for the printf directive to skip the part of the stack and then directly delete the random value. And then in the source code, I kindly mentioned that the layout. So you can take a look at this, but I highly recommend practicing with the disassembly code. So the length is too far. So you cannot put percent P's in the 63 bytes of the data. So putting percent P a lot, it will never work. So you must use that. So with the 30, 61 bytes, 63 bytes, we can only have a 31% P if we remove all the space. So we cannot do that. And then you can calculate all the values and then you can also use GDB to check where the value is stored and then where the printf fetches the first argument. Yeah. And then just do the subtract and then divide it by four for the 32 bit, divide it by eight for the 64 bit to get the exact number for this one. And then if that number is 77, so the answer is not 77. Yeah. So if that is 77, it will directly put the random number. And then one of the strategy is that you can programmatically generate the 5% P's with the percent 77, 78, 79, 7, 90, and then do that again and again. Yeah, you can eventually get the answer. Yeah. And then I will also allow that because that's a good hacker man's method. Yeah. So for the second challenge, please practice use of the dollar flag yeah, in printf. Any questions? Next. So in this case, we just learned about it's just a sequential read, right? Relative to the stack, we can control the value and then read it, yeah. But the, what we want is not just for arbitrary read. So the question is that, is there any way that we can perform arbitrary read. And this is a rhetorical question, right? Yeah, yes, we can do. And then I emphasize the difference between the X, D, P, and the S, because percent X, percent D, percent P, these are all regarding the argument as a value. But percent S, it will regard the argument as a pointer. So it will read the string into that pointer, in that pointer, and then print out the string. And then how many of you have used a percent %n in printf? I'm sure that all of you have used percent %s. Then mostly none of you use percent %n in the regular programming. Yeah, but we will use that a lot because that's the only directive that we can write some of the value to the memory using printf. So this is a very interesting. So what percent %n does is if I put asdf and percent %n, so I printed four characters asdf. So it will store printed number of bytes up to this point, four, into the that argument as a pointer. You will see like how it works uh, with the example. So <clears throat> percent n is for storing number of printed characters to a variable. So for example, if we run this ASDF and percent n and then m percent i to get the pointer of the integer i, then it will store four to i.
what happens if we run this? So it will print one, the first argument goes X. So it will print one, two, three, four, five, length of the character. And then percent N will get the second argument. So it will store one, two, three, four, five to I. And then we will use percent N to enable arbitrary write compatibility for printf. And we will use percent %s to enable arbitrary read capability for printf. Any questions about percent %n directive? Yes. So it will be word, double word for 32 bit, and it will be quad word for 64 bit. And then there's a directive called HN, half word. And then there's a directive, called, another directive, we can write the byte, HHN, yeah, half, half word. <laughs> yeah, HHN is one byte, HN is two bytes, and then N is four bytes for 32 bit. And then 64 bit, I'm not sure for the, the behavior of the HN, but the, that will be two bytes, I believe. Yeah. But the sum of the implementation of the GLFC does not follow the standard. So you need to check that with GDB first. Yeah. Is there no other question? I believe there should be a case question for like the uh, what is the normal use case of the, the percent n, <laughs> right? You have never used it before. Yeah. So like the, the, in old days, computers are very slow. Yeah. So checking and tracking about like how many bytes you printed separately. Yeah. And the maintaining the console screen. So have you played the, some of the snake game and console kind of thing. Yeah, to do that, uh, what we can do is like, we can keep printing the 80 lines again and again to update uh, this kind of the snake movement or something. But uh, in old days, uh, printing many characters were super slow with the uh, one megahertz CPU with the uh, four kilobyte RAM. <laughs> yeah, so C language was developed with that, that era, yeah. So what they did is they just updated the single characters, tried to do the diff, and then just updated the different part frame by frame and how they worked. And then in doing that, they want to track uh, how many bytes were printed into the screen and then go back and then update. Yeah. And in doing that, they have used percent n. And I have not checked the implementation of the N curses in these days, but the similar functionality implemented in the, some other library uses present N yeah, to keep track of like how many characters were printed on the screen. So that's the old day things. And then nowadays we are running the four gigahertz, five gigahertz CPU. So we don't care about that. Yeah. And then the, let me tell you another thing. So Python. We don't have semicolon to cut off the string, cut off the line in Python, but we do have semicolon in C language. Do you know why? So in human mind, new line breaks as a new code line. That's very intuitive. Then. I don't know if this is the exact answer or not, but my conjecture is that at that time, computers were very slow. And then we want to write a parser. And then, so in some cases, we would like to press enter in the middle of the argument 
to lines not going over 80 or something. So to do that in C language, we can just press enter. Yeah. Maybe to enable that, they can do that. But if we do not have a semicolon, then they need to parse this kind of a lot, this kind of the code a lot to determine what is the end of the line. Yeah. But by inserting the semicolon at the end, compiler operation could be much more simplified. So if we have a specific indicator of the end of line, no ambiguity, then we don't have to parse for that. Yeah. So my conjecture is that, so without semicolon, compilation time could be super long in all days, but with the help of the semicolon, yeah, computers work fast. And then at that time, human labor much was much cheaper than the computers. So that's why the language designers uh, determined to like the, uh, make the, all the humans type the semicolon yeah, to make the computer happy. But uh, do you know the computer science subject area called the human computer interaction? Yeah. That kind of term comes in after, like the highlighted after 1990s, after our computers got fast enough. Yeah. And then most of the languages designed after that era yeah, tries to think about like the human productivity and those kind of things. And you might heard about the C is not productive. So like the, even if that's slow, we use a Ruby on Rails or a Python Flask for web development. Because nowadays, human labor is much more expensive than the computers and the computers are so fast. So it's better to remove semicolon kind of thing, more intuitive and then, yeah. We can also have less fatigue to not type in semicolon. Yeah, that's my conjecture. Yeah, I'm not sure like that. I cannot find any documentary reason for that. Yeah, but uh, that's just my, uh, I don't know if it's true or not. That's my philosophy. How do you think about that? <laughs> yeah, professors has a lot of spare time. So I think about like this kind of thing every day. <laughs> So to launch the sequential legal tag, what we need to do is just put percent P for the format string read one. So percent P a lot, then we can read the value. Something like this. But we will focus on this value. So this is actually percent P space percent p space so like this kind of input will be shown as a printf so the implication is that we can put the real arguments to the printf so the input that we supplied will be can be used as an argument of the printf that means we can control that Then what if we put an address and then what is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. An address at the start, four byte address and present S, present seven S. Then printf will regard our address value as an argument that we typed at the head of the input. And then percent s, it will get into that pointer and then read out the string data. That's how you can launch the arbitrary read attack. And then the reason why it shows percent p is like it described as this. So we have a buffer and then that buffer is also on the stack. And then if we go up and up and up, it will eventually hit the buffer part. But the important part is this one. Suppose we give an input to, so the, for the format string one read challenge, the GOT entry of the printf is at A04A010. And then if we can leak that, then we can know the address of the printf. Then we can calculate the address of the exact VE. 
that don't run any kind of thing. So how you can do arbitrary read is that after getting this kind of the address, what you can do is put the first four bytes as the that address. Then that will be put onto the stack beautifully like this. And then after that, you will put percent seven dollar s because sixth argument is this one seventh argument is the head of the buffer so to launch that because percent s will reference the pointer so if you put the wrong data here then you will get segmentation fault so to avoid that every time you want to use percent s practice with percent p first so percent seven dollar p if that prints out the address you typed you supplied at the head of the buffer then if you replace that as an s then it will read data from here and then print out the address of the printout any questions about this method so the logic is that printf will get the argument from the stack. And then our buffer is also on the stack. So we can put any kind of value and then that can be used as an argument. And then for that argument, if that is an address, if we use percent %s, it will lick the data for us. So capability is that uh, it can read the string. So percent %s will stop reading the data if it meets the zero byte. So suppose we have a value, something like uh, this kind of thing inside of the that address. And we will try to print out A and stop. Then, how can you read full bytes? So the one of the trick is that you can put multiple addresses and then seven, eight, nine, 10, these are argument order. And then this will print out, it could print out many characters, but some of the characters bar, some of the characters, bar, some of the characters, bar, something like this. Then you can observe that the, what are the output? And then like the, if you see two bars, then that means that either the output is bar or zero, yeah, two choices. You can reduce down your conjecture in the narrow space. So you can eventually get the value is something like this. So even if printf stop reading at zero, we don't give up. Just move to the next address, printf. So for zero, you will automatically know that if the length is short, that that by zero, and then that address plus one, starting from there, printf. Then you can print one string, zero, second string, zero, and then you can read whatever you want with using the printf. And then it could end up with the zero, 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 but you can even detect that because nothing will be printed. That's why I inserted this kind of bar, but uh, you need to prune out the, if the real data is a bar zero, yeah, then like the, you need to distinguish that. So format string arbitrary read, that challenge, stores the random value not on the stack. So the random value is stored into the global variable. So its address is 8048 something, not the stack address at all. Yeah. And then you need to guess that random value. So how you can solve that is try to get the address of the global value, random value. And then suppose that address is this one. Then what you can do is put this address in little and draw in the end, 50 a 0 and then calculate the argument position and then try to leak that with percent $7 S. 
And then you can easily do that using pawn tools using P32 address and then attaching the directives. And then read the console output, then you can get that random value. So the visual diagram is something like this. So the reason why I put the, all these kind of the diagram is like the, how I hang is like, a, I always draw this kind of diagram in my head after I look at the disassembly. So if you can draw it, then your exploit success rate goes up and up and up. And then I highly recommend the practicing drawing something in your iPad or some of the paper. But if you do that, 100 time or something then you will see that you can draw in your head yeah so that will be very helpful for writing an exploit and then the, you only need one diagram for a stack but if you get to the heave exploit then you need to draw like the seven to eight diagrams so you need to pra practice a lot and then for that one i cannot even like the draw in my head so i also draw the thing so the, and then I know the Loki Hart, the world's best hacker, he also draw pencil and paper. Yeah. So that's the best hacker's method, paper and pencil. Yeah. And then arbitrary write. So before moving on to arbitrary write, any questions about arbitrary read? So percent S, that's your friend for reading the data. So arbitrary write can be done with percent N because what percent S does is like regarding the argument as a pointer and the read the value. And then percent N is writing the value to the pointer, which value, number printed character. Yeah. Then if we write the, something like this, then it will write, number four because we printed four characters and then present seven dollar n so it will store number four into the goto printf but what we want to do is after leaking the address of the printf we can get the address of the system and then if we can overwrite the system address to the printf got then printf will be turned into system then how can we write not the number four? How can we write arbitrary value? So think about it. So for arbitrary read and write, there are two capability, uh, two, two restrictions. So attackers need to specify address. And then we can specify the address with the buffer content here. And then the second thing is like the, we need to uh, specify how many data. And then that can be repeated by yeah by repeating this kind of thing again and again then we can also do that but the arbitrary read we will just read but the, for arbitrary write we also need to specify the value which value to write so we can write arbitrary value so that's why format string variability can turn into arbitrary write So no matter what kind of argument we have, we can print out specific length of the bytes by specifying the length of the format. So if we put percent 10x with number one, it will print out 10 characters. Percent 10,000x with argument one, 10,999 blank characters and one. And then you can also do this. But if we go over like some of the integer max or something, it would not look. Okay. And then there is a format string arbitrary write. For that challenge, you need to store this value. So you need to change the global random value to this specific 32 bit byte. And then for the 64 bit, I also want to have a 64 byte value but uh, uh, i don't want to make you too hard yeah the challenge too hard so it's four by two yeah then how can he write that value 
So this value is quite huge. Unsigned integer is like you know, over 4 billion. And then if you use this, try to do that, you need to wait until console outputs like four gigabytes, <laughs> then just wait, wait. And then console output is quite slow. Yeah. And then you will not get the answer. Yeah. And you cannot get the answer like uh, until the class finishes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's not the method. Yeah. No. Yeah. So the challenge is that printing 4 billion characters are super slow. And then this kind of vulnerability can happen on the server. Then if you want to overwrite one value, you need to download four gigabyte. And then that's quite high profile and then it can easily get cut off and detected by like the IDS or something like that. Yeah, so we don't do that. Yeah. And then 64 bit, you do have 48 bits. Yeah. Do you want to the, print out the 2256 tera? amount of the character no yeah and then it will take a, your lifetime to do that yeah so we need to override the, this kind of value and you don't want to do that yeah so the trick is so Milan asked the about like the, how can we write like the small number of bytes yeah and then we will use that trick yeah to override the thing. So the trick is that we can split write, maybe one byte at a time, two bytes at a time. Then I prefer like writing two bytes at a time because like the, it will reduce the number of times you need to put the argument and then the address. And also printing two bytes, the maximum number is 64 kilobyte, and then printing 64 kilobyte can be finished in less than one second. Yeah. So. Let's see how we can put the value Facebook into the, that address. So we will basically write two bytes each. So we will prepare two addresses. So if the target address is 8044A010, then we will put the first address at the start and second address as a plus two. And then we will perform two writes. So it will print eight bytes. And then what we will do is we will do the, we will write the, because it says one zero, one one, one two, one three, because this is a little in the end. So in the memory, it'll be stored as a zero, one, two, three for like the, the address. So we need to write the, lower two bytes first. So we want to write BOOC, but we already printed addresses as the eight bytes, two addresses. So what we need to do is percent zero X BOOC minus eight. We need to calculate that and then put that on the, as a like decimal number and then X. We don't care about print whatever. Yeah. So that, that's actually four, four, five, zero, six, zero. Yeah, this value. And then this added with the eight byte will be zero X B O C B zero zero C. And then percent seven dollar N. So it will overwrite B zero zero C and also overwrite zero 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 for the top bytes. Something like this. Because percent N will overwrite full four bytes. And then what we will do, we want to write FACE face to this address. Then we already printed the BOOC number. So FACE minus BOOC, that's this number. Then we don't care what kind of thing is printed. We only cares about the length. And then percent $8 N, it will use the second address. Then it will overwrite 0000, 0, 0, 0 face in this address range. So as a result, it will overwrite 0C, V0, CE, FA for full four bytes. And then it, as a side effect, it will also overwrite two more bytes. But do we care about that? Yeah, in doing hacking, we don't care. 
Yeah. But sometimes we have to care if that ruins our attack, then we need to fill that bytes. And then also like that we can use HN to only overwrite two bytes. Yeah. Yes, question. That's the next slide. Okay. Yeah, you're smart. I like you. <laughs> so the full attack string could be something like this. Yeah. I believe if you just push this into the like the uh, the the challenge, it will work. Yeah, this is the solution, I believe. <laughs> but I I know that the, you will all practice this with the by hand and palm tools. Yeah. So the next slide is this one. Yeah, that might answer your question, right? Yeah, yeah. So what we will do is like we want to write five, six, seven, eight first. So to do that. We print two addresses, so we need to do five, six, seven, eight minus eight percent x percent n. Yeah, slide is incorrect. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, and then to the address plus two, we need to write one, two, three, four. How we can do that? If we do this, it will result in the negative number. And the hacker's method is like the, we don't care about like the side effect. We only care for the four byte. So we will do is like one, one, two, three, four. So previously, BOC phase and zero, zero. And the BOC phase is zero, zero, right? Then it will be five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, zero, one, zero, zero. But we don't care for that zero one. So it'll be something like this. Any question about this method? No? Yeah. So the important thing is like the, the question was what if this value is bigger than this value? Okay. Then we can make this value more bigger. Yeah. That's the hacker's method. So that's why I keep emphasizing we need to be creative. Yeah. So there's no restriction. So uh, I believe in this class, I have not talked about that, but in CS370, yeah, last term, like uh, I mentioned that like uh, what I'm doing with computers are playing GTA. Yeah. And then this is something like that. Yeah, we don't care about smashing others. What we care is about the, like our goal. And then if that is match it, we just go forward. So don't live like GTA in the real life. And then also do not mess with the other computers, but with your computer and my VMCTF servers, you can play GTA. Yeah. And then 64 bit. Yeah. 64 bit is a little bit different because we use six bytes address, it contains zero. So suppose you want to write Facebook, this value into this address. So if we want to use the same method, we will prepare two addresses. Addresses are something like that. Will it print 16 bytes? No, it will stop it here. It will print three bytes. And then if you add percent n something, it will never work. So with the calculation, we could have like the sum of the output, like the calculation like this, and then add these kind of directives at the end. It will never work because your printf stop it here whenever it sees zero bytes. That's the limitation of the string uh, operation. And then there are a lot of that kind of case. And then that's why I emphasize that removing zeros in your shell code. Yeah. Because there are a lot of string loaded functions. So that is described in this slide. And then how can you avoid this? 
So from the student who have never exploited a string variable, because I know some of OSU you six students know the answer. Yeah, don't answer that. <laughs> so can you guess how we can avoid this? So it's very similar to uh, ROP for 64-bit. In 32-bit, we call the function and put the argument. In 64-bit, we set the argument and then call the function. That's the hint. Then how can you avoid the zeros? In 32-bit, we put address first and then directive. How can you avoid printing zeros in the address in 64-bit? No. Yeah, so we can put directive first and then address. Because when we are putting the buffer, it will use F gets. It will get all the zeros. But how printf uses your argument is just based on the stack, it will use it. So we don't have to print the address at all. So we will put the directive first, present something, yeah, those first, and then put the addresses at the, at the end. So that's why I always emphasize that uh, if you make a middle roadblock, don't think that that's impossible. Yeah. So there's always the way to avoid that. Yeah, something like that. So how can you put one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight to this address? So to write that, you want to do something like this. Five, six, seven, eight, X percent to N, and then plus for the address plus two, one, two, three, four, minus five, six, seven, eight, but that's a small number. Then we add one, 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 two, three, four. And then for the eight bytes, so we need to get like the uh, two, one, two, three, four, three, one, two, three, four. We can do that again and again. Yeah. So we need to prepare this kind of the directive string first. And then you will see some of the weird thing. I add AA here. The reason is I want to align the entire string length as a multiple of eight bytes. Because how printf fetches the argument is in the 64 bit will be multiple of eight bytes as a block. Otherwise, your addresses will be misaligned. So because the length of the string is 22 bytes, I add two more A's to make it as a 24 bytes, multiple of eight. Then, if we attach the address at the end, it will correctly fetch address align one from the printf. So after we make multiple of eight for the target directive screen, based on the value to overwrite, we attach addresses at the end. Then Printf will stop working at this place, but we don't care. We already write the old values. And then we use seven to point to the start of the buffer, but we have a 24 bytes of the data that is not the address at the start. So 24 is three blocks of the eight bytes. We need to shift argument order three more. So seven will be 10. Eight will be 11 to fetch this and that address. So printf will process all the colored parts and then stop printing at here. But for the colored parts, it only consumed the argument. So that's why it works. So in 32-bit, you can also do this. But uh, if you put the address first, you don't have to match the alignment. Yeah, 
That's why I introduced that method first. But in 32-bit, if you encounter zero byte address, then you have to use this method. So no matter for 32-bit, 64-bit, this method is much safer, but uh, you need to take care about like, matching the alignment. Yeah, then you will have no problem. And then this method is quite neat. You don't have to calculate how many addresses you printed. Directly use like the, the value first and then that value minus the another value minus that value. Yeah, do that. So how you can solve format string arbitrary write is that you need to overwrite the target global value to specific value. So get that address first. And then in 32-bit, put those address and then that address close to, and then percent x this amount and percent n for that argument. And then percent x for this value minus that value put that and present that. So use percent x to print out that many characters and percent add to n to overwrite the value. And then I prefer percent x because like the, uh, yeah, I'm a human. I'm also familiar with the decimal numbers, but uh, when I do hacking, uh, it'll be better to see everything in hexadecimal number. Yeah, that might be helpful. And then in 64-bit, you need to put the address at the end. Then you can use the same method to build a directive. And then you need to match the alignment. Then you can exploit that. Any questions for the arbitrary write method? So you will encounter a lot of problems <laughs> about like a calculation and the others for like when doing that. But uh, what I recommend is before doing percent %s or percent %n, please practice with percent %p first. Then you will see that the which address it will use in the output. So try with percent %p first. And then if the printed addresses are correct, then replace that as a print %s or %n, depending on arbitrary read and write. So I just explained the 64-bit arbitrary write, but for the 64-bit arbitrary read, everything will be the same. The difference is n need to be s. So s is for reading the pointer, and then n is for writing the pointer. And then for s, you don't need to you print out that many characters or something. And then after learning about arbitrary read and write, our ultimate goal is getting a shell. So the next challenge is a format string code execution. So there are two format string vulnerability. So you need to use first format string vulnerability as an arbitrary read to leak the GOT entry of the printf. After that, you can calculate the address of the system function and I kindly did set regid for you. Yeah. yeah. So just get the system function. And then using the second printf as arbitrary write, you can update printf or some other function that program calls as a system. So if you replace the printf into system, and it will print out, so it asks for name, and then it prints out welcome, some of the name, right? So when we run the welcome, it will run system welcome. And then you can make the welcome as a BSH and then set the path, then you can get a shell. So by combining arbitrary read and arbitrary write, so that's why we practice that in AW2 yeah, challenge. Yeah. And then if you do the same thing with the printf, you can get the code execution. Any question for that method? And then another challenge, the last one is format string code execution PIE. So I enabled all the protections. So the, you don't have the code address fixed, but don't worry. So 
from this, it has a three chances that you can leak these addresses. So using the sequential leak, you can leak the return address of the input function. That might be definitely somewhere in the main function. That's the code address. So using that as a sequential leak with a lot of print percent P or something, yeah. Get the address of the main specific address, then you can calculate where is the GOT of the printf because that's in the same region of the code region. And then PIE has been broken. Then the next two is the same as this one. So leak the GOT of the printf, calculate the offset of the system, and then overwrite that GOT of the printer into the system. So it will involve one more step than code execution. So to exploit the PIE binary, you need to have a two leaks and one write. That's what I want to teach for this challenge. Uh, any questions about this method? So up to this challenge, it will not be super difficult, but uh, there is a challenge, extra credit one, uh, home string code execution, PIE, no binary. That's not PIE, yeah, but no binary. Yeah. So for that challenge, I do not give you any kind of binary information, but what you need to do is, you can use that as the sequential leak and then get the code address and then Leak the code content. And then you can compose a binary by your own. And then you can open that with GDV, then you can analyze the binary problem. And then that happens in reality. Yeah. And then if you want to good be a good hacker, yeah, you need to redo that. <laughs> and then if you finish like the up to this challenge, then you will see that uh, doing that is not that difficult, just one step forward. And then if we use printf many times, then we can leak the entire content of memory. Yeah. And then after that, you can exploit the vulnerability in there. And then you can find the, where the GOT entry is. And then you can do this at the end. Then you can get the flag. So week six, fetch week six will not fetch that challenge. So it's a remote challenge. You need to connect to the uh, server, yeah. but uh, you can exploit that without having any kind of binary information. And then one hint is that like not all challenges, the final CTF will include many interesting challenges. So to give a little hint, final CTF may include that kind of uh, difficult challenges. And then the, one of the challenge I will release is so-called the blind drop. So I will not give you a binary, but the, you need to exploit the buffer overflow vulnerability and then launching the rob attack. You can do that. So it'll be fun. But uh, I said I will set the oldest scores for the final CTF as an extra credit. So don't get nervous a lot. <laughs> it'll be fun. So the, all the challenges are already uh, released, uh, like play with that with the VMCTF2 server. And then I set the due date and then March 8th. And then uh, maybe some of you got that hint that like the, I keep mentioning that on Discord, I personally don't like due date. Yeah, I hope you know what it means, <laughs> but uh, let's have a due date like this. All right, uh, this is the end for the lecture today. And then we only have a little bit of time for the exercise. Yeah, please do so. And then ask any questions to myself and Lucas.